Today we're going to talk about bison and we've got some things for you to see, uh, to get some things to hold. It's kind of a fun session. So this is the American bison. Now your friends may call it a buffalo and you might, and even I occasionally might make a mistake, but a bison is not a buffalo. Buffaloes are in a different uh, family, very closely related, but totally different. Uh, bison is in the bovid family and that's with the yak. Let me get your, we got our pointer up here. So that's with the cow and the Asian yak. Uh, and uh, this is a buffalo, African buffalo. There's a uh, uh, water buffalo. Here is our bison. Now, at one time in a period of 1800 to 1840, we know that there were at least 60 million bison that covered the plains. They went from Western Missouri all the way out to Colorado, from Texas up north to Canada. You can see this range was tremendous. Now, before 1800, there were a lot of bison in this area, even in the east going up as far as New York. They were called wood bison, and it was just a slight difference, and they didn't live in the huge numbers. We're going to get to those numbers a bit, a little bit later because it's not always been that way. So, the bison is a very interesting animal. It has very thick coat and very little fat. And that pays off in the wintertime when it's cold. They have that very thick coat. They shed it in the summer. You notice this, this uh, bison here, here in the summer in Yosemite, has very little hair on the back portion here. So that radiates, let, lets it radiate off the heat and survive hot weather. The males and females travel basically in separate herds. In around uh, June through September, the males, particularly the older males, come together with the female herd. The females have had their calves in the April and May uh, period. So the males come in and they mate during that time. Uh, males tend to be otherwise in their own uh, herds. They tend to be very irritable and uh, unpredictable. So many of the people that were reporting in the 1800s, eight, uh, 1840s, uh, buffalo hunters, bison, see I did it, <laughs> bison hunters, uh, they re remarked that things would be going along fine and then suddenly for some re unknown reason, one of these males would turn and charge them. So they're very unpredictable. The, the young are born in April and May and within hours of being born, they are running with the herd. So there's no laying around, they're out in the pasture, they have to be on the move. So they will be up several hours later and uh, looking for food and following mom. Uh, the predators for them were wolves, humans, occasionally a grizzly bear. Uh, there are reports of a single wolf taking down a bison, although usually the wolves hunt in packs. And we had, as you remember with Schoolcraft, we had uh, wolves here as well as bison. They have a very strong neck and head. So during the winter, even when the snow is very deep, they'll snow plow into it, put their head down and push it up the snow to get to the grass that's laying down there. It's, it's uh, a dead grass, but it's still edible. So let's think for a minute, how would you hunt a bison, particularly if you didn't have a gun, uh, you were a Native American, let's say a thousand, two thousand years ago. Well, there's a couple different ways that they could hunt. Remember, uh, one way would be to sneak up on them. Now, this picture is idealized. This was drawn uh, in about 1850. And what they didn't know, you can see in a close up, they're sneaking up with a bow and arrow. But in actual fact, the bow and arrow only came here around 600 AD. That's when they first, uh, when uh, the Native Americans first invented the bow and arrow here. So before that, they were hunting with spear and at ladle, a throwing stick, which you'll be throwing later on this year. Uh, they, uh, there are, tr was tradition that sometimes they would wear a wolf skin to mask a human smell I don't know how accurate that is. Since the wolf was one of their predators, it doesn't seem like the brightest thing to dress up as. <laughs> but another way that they traditionally did it was with bison jumps. 
And these were big uh, cliffs or uh, sometimes a canyon where they would run them in with the, with the bison jump. They would run them over a cliff. They would fall down and then like here, and then they would come down and collect the, the bodies. And there's a number of these that have archeologically been uh, proven where they find lots and lots of bison bones. Some of those were over a 40 foot fall. Uh, they also sometimes would herd them into a narrow canyon uh, and then try and slaughter them with spears. Uh, then the horse came along and once the horse and the bow and arrow were uh, going, uh, they, we had a, they had a real system. Uh, it surprised me that a, a uh, hunter with a bow and arrow could shoot a arrow into the chest of a bison and it would come out the other side. So the bow and arrow were that powerful that they could penetrate all the way through. In that case, if it got both lungs, not in addition to bleeding, the, the uh, collapsed lungs, it couldn't breathe and pretty soon would drop. So once they had killed a bison, and by the way, the Native Americans then and to this day had a number of um, ceremonies that they did before hunting, during hunting and after hunting, thanking the bison for the food, uh, asking the bison to forgive them for killing it, that they need it. Once they brought it into camp, it was butchered for the meat. Uh, the hides, as you can see here, would be st uh, staked out in the sun, and once they're scraped clean, you would have uh, the, uh, the hide which they could tan or use as it was, and they would butcher, obviously, the meat for clothing, <laughs> but they used everything, and this was, uh, you know, out, if you think about there, you're living out on the prairie, there's not a whole lot of wood around, uh, there's uh, bison and uh, the need for <laughs> shelter. So it had, the bison was really, with the Plains Indians, it was the, the center of their world. So for food, they would eat it fresh, uh, the, eating the meat, cooking the meat, uh, taking the brains. The brain has a lot of energy in it and it doesn't sound very good to us, but they would cook the brain as well. Then there was the food storage. It was stored as jerky. How many of you have ever had beef jerky? Okay, I see a number there, all right. Well, jerky is generally a, is meat that has been processed, pounded, uh, put in spices. The jerky that you had probably had some spice to it, sometimes a, a little peppery taste to it. Uh, they, in pounding their meat, they would take the jerk, the meat, and they would string it and stretch, uh, stretch it over a fire and not cook it, but dry it out. And uh, then just use it in that way and they could uh, cook with it. Another thing that they did was long-term storage. Like your family may have, uh, certainly have a cool, uh, freezer full of food, uh, canned things, uh, canned meat. Well, their canning process didn't have a can but they made pemmican and pemmican, they would take a, the meat, they would dry it, then they would pound it up. So it's in little fragments. They would then pour melted fat over it. So far, that doesn't sound terribly good to me. And they would store it that way. They would frequently put in nuts or berries to add flavor. But the thing that was interesting about this, they would put this into a pile generally about so thick and have multiple layers of that they could store it, they could wrap it in a hide, for instance, and bury it, and it would last for one to five years. Uh, the uh, mountain men, the people that went trapping in Colorado, uh, looking for beaver pelts, etc., uh, they loved pemmican. Actually, there was a story of one trapper that came back to St. Louis and brought a load of pemmican, and he preferred that to other food. Uh, what they would do with the pemmican usually would be to cook with it, put it in a stew or other, other ways of cooking it. So the bison was used for everything. It was kind of the, uh, it was al almost like the Walmart of the plains. So let's go through these. I'm going to take some time to go through these because you're going to see, be picking some of these things up. Uh, good news, you're not going to be handling the brains today. But uh, uh, the hide, there are two ways that you could use the hide. Tanned hide, they would spread it out 
they would uh, uh, put on uh, 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 chemicals on it, usually the brain. They would take the brain and rub it into the hide and that would soften the hide and make it flexible. So you could use it for moccasins or robes uh, for the cover of teepees, uh, their, uh, their house cover, uh, gun covers uh, when they had guns later, belts, anything that was nice and flexible and soft out of leather had to be tanned. Now, you've heard of rawhide, I'm sure. Rawhide is the hide that's taken off, and as the word says, it's raw. They, take, they scrape off the hair, and then you have the, uh, just the hide. That rawhide tends to be stiff and hard, up like this, rather than soft and flexible like tanned. And so it could be used for a number of things, and even the settlers used it for things that they wanted to have firm. If you've ever uh, been on a horse saddle, you know the saddle is hard, you know, the, the leather over it. You don't, that's a rawhide, rather than being soft, it if it was a tanned hide, it would slip and slide under you. So uh, this is a way of making the rawhide uh, stiff. It was used for moccasin soles, for belts, uh, any container that you wanted to be firm. Uh, quirts are uh, short whips, and the handle of which would be the rawhide be stiff. The horns could be made into a lot of different things, and you're going to see that today, and uh, you'll see a couple of really very nice, pretty black cups that are very smooth and polished that look like plastic, but they're actually made from the horns, because if you take the horn, you can boil it and warm it and boil it and shape it and it's very soft and when it dries it's firm and that's what they've done. The, the cups that you're going to see today came from a North Dakota tribe that made, made those for sale. The brains we said primarily for hide preparation occasionally would be eaten. Skulls were used just for religious ceremonies as you'll get to handle a bison skull today or touch one you'll recognize there's not a whole lot of other things you could do with a skull. They're pretty big. The tongue was the best part of the meat. And that was good news for the Native Americans. Uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, that was bad news for the bison when, uh, when the settlers came along. The beard had hair, longer hair that could be used for ornaments and hair in general could be used as a saddle pad filler. You could put it in your, uh, 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 shoes uh, uh, to uh, be a soft for pillows, ropes. You could use it to, to uh, uh, weave uh, rope out of it. The hooves, this is something else uh, interesting. You're going to get to handle hooves today. Now they could be made into rattles or ceremonial things, but one of the main things that they did is by boiling the, ho the hoof down, it becomes soft and when it, it uh, hardens, it's a glue. In fact, many of the, much of the early glue around the 1900, 1920 was made from hooves. And so it's kind of the Elmer's glue of its time. The stomach was frequently used as a container. Uh, for one thing, uh, in cooking, uh, they, especially early on before, let's you know, say two or 3000 years ago, before they had developed pottery, they needed ways of holding things to cook. And what you could do is take a stomach and you're going to get to see and hold a dried stomach and the braver of you is gonna put your hand down inside it. But what they would do is they would put uh, whatever they wanted to cook, let's say uh, beans, corn, etc. They would put inside there, they would add water and then they would take red hot rocks out of a fire, pick them up with sticks and drop them in there and those red hot rocks would cause that water to boil. And so the way they could boil before they had a hard containers would be with a stomach of a bison. How about dung? Pui, poop. Well, dried, it makes an excellent fuel. Uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, people even have, uh, uh, down in Oklahoma, that tells you about Oklahoma, uh, they will uh, have dung flinging contests where they pick them up and see how far they can throw them like a discus. But the Native Americans, that was an excellent fuel, as was the settlers. The settlers also used that for fuel. It burnt well and it burnt prolonged. 
because really what it is, is digested grass, which is just something that burns. Uh, the bones could be used for knives, knife handles, arrowheads, uh, shovels, scrapers, uh, war clubs, or for uh, other reasons. The fat was made for cooking oil and for soap. And you'll get the handle of a tail. And we know some of the Native Americans use the tail as a ceremonial uh, item. It could also be used as a, a to brush away flies, kind of like a fly swatter. And then, of course, we've talked about the meat. So if you think about it, there's not much left that didn't get used when you killed a, a bison. And out there, not having much else, it was the Walmart. Then here came the uh, settlers. Initially, the settlers in schoolcraft time in 1830s and 1840s, they were getting out there some. They were hunting bison. They were using bison. But uh, it there wasn't really having much impact on 60 million bison out there. Uh, shortly after the war, of uh, Civil War, so about 1865-70, the uh, railroad started extending beyond Missouri. So it was back in Rolla when, uh, during the Civil War and rapidly within 10 years, it was extending through uh, uh, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma to get to the West Coast. And it took a lot of fuel to build the railroad. It took wood that we talked about last time, cutting all the, the wood down all the trees to make the railroad ties that you see here. Uh, but they also needed a lot of food. And the prime source of meat was uh, bison. And so Buffalo Bill, that was his name, as again, they didn't necessarily know there weren't, they weren't buffalo. Buffalo Bill is said to have killed 20,000 over nine years. Now he was also became a showman uh, and so we don't know how much of that, but he had a reputation for that. There was an Orlando Brown that we do know, he was, he was uh, killing bison both for feeding the railroad and for running the bison meat back uh, east. He was averaging killing 97 bison a day, 97. So uh, in 1872 to 1874, over 4 million, uh, were killed, 4 million bison were killed, and 1 million were killed by the Native Americans. So most of them were killed by uh, the uh, uh, European settlers that were coming in. Now, there was also another, this is kind of a sad portion, this was, they advertised hunting by rail, and wealthy Eastern hunters who would come out, would ride the train out, get on the train, the train would roll along and when, a, uh, when they came across a bison herd, they would slow the train to run at the same, to move at the same rate as a bison herd. And these hunters would shoot out the windows or up on top and shoot out and shoot and kill as many bison as they could and leave the bodies. They just were out there to kill bison. Uh, it's uh, not unlike in some ways uh, hunting in Africa where you go hunt uh, an animal, uh, take its head, stuff it, bring it home and leave the animal there. Only in this case, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of animals there. Now, there was no conservation at that time. Nobody ever dreamed that the bison wouldn't last forever and probably didn't really care a lot whether they did. So in fact, it was quite the opposite. And this is a very sad time in our history of our nation. Uh, there were settlers that were moving out through Missouri and into Kansas. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Native Americans in the East were given treaties to move out here. We'll pay you so much, you leave our land here in Ohio and you move out to Missouri and we'll pay you so much. Whoops, here comes the settlers to Missouri. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll make another treaty with you. We'll pay you money to move out to Kansas. And uh, then, well, now we've got settlers who want to move to Kansas. So, are we okay? Okay, 
So now we want to move the settlers to Kansas. Uh, by this time, the government is saying, we need to have the Native Americans, the Indians, as they were called, we need to have them move to reservations where they will grow crops and live like farmers using smaller amounts of land because we want the rest of the land. But the Native Americans, they wanted to hunt and live the way they always had. So there became a government policy of killing bison off so that the tribes would be forced to uh, raise their own food because there wasn't enough bison to hunt. So not only were they being killed for sport, being killed to, uh, to feed people, shipping their food back, their hides back, uh, their hides were valuable in the east. They were now just deliberately killing them off to reduce the population. A terrible time when we look at it from our point of view. So the bison harvest, they harvested them from robes, uh, bison hats, the big top hats that they wore in Europe. Bison was the most popular type hide for that. Uh, they, their hides were very tough and they didn't have rubber belts for machinery. And so in those times they were using bison uh, leather for belts. And bu a buffalo tongue, they called it, bison tongue, became a very popular food item back east. It used, people spent a lot of money for that tongue. And so we have lots and lots of records of where the hunters would go out. They would kill the bison takes a lot of time and, and effort to pack up all the meat, get it back to a railroad and ship it home. But they could take the tongue and make big money out of that tongue and just leave the bison out there. Terrible from our point of view. And then there were leftover bison skulls. These are, this is one of many pictures of a, a mound of skulls. Those are all bison skulls here. Yeah, I can't think of how many hundred thousand there are in that. The reason they were collecting those is those could be ground down to fertilizer. So this is after the bison had been killed. They weren't killing them for the skulls, but then they were collecting those skulls. And frequently those kills would all be in one area. So you could go out and pick up a couple hundred skulls from one patch of ground. There's another pile of bison skulls that you can see that goes long and hard. And you notice how there's nothing else out here in this plains area. Well, that could have been the end. Eventually, they were down to an estimated 400. But fortunately, it was not the end. And that's due to things that we talk about all the time. And you and I are going to uh, be talking about all the rest of the year. And that's conservation conserving what we have. So in the beginnings, the bison uh, conservation, Yellowstone National Park was one of the pl first places. And so Yellowstone National Park was created. It became one of the first protected species in this new park. 1894, Congress had an 1894 Lacey Act. They made it illegal to kill by uh, the protected bison within the park. Uh, with that, other people began to conserve it. Uh, now we have, we have returned bison into the tribal lands where many of the tribes in the Western states have their own bison herds, which they treat uh, conservatively. Uh, some of them uh, raise them as cattle. Others of them uh, manage them more like wildlife and less like wild stock. They will have large area where they can uh, live normally. So the bison population, we think in 1850 was around 60 million, 60 million. By 1890, 1,000, some people say down to 400. Now it's back to 350,000. And that's all due to our conservation efforts. So these are some of the management areas that you can see where they have uh, bison are uh, being maintained. This is the historical range of where bison were. This is where bison are currently. Have any of you seen a bison in Missouri? Good. Yes, right. There are a couple places. There's one out, um, uh, 
what's, I can't think of MM there. Uh, there's uh, up by Wilson's Creek Battlefield, just north of there, there's an area that has several bison. Uh, uh, there's, I can think of three different areas around where you can drive and see bison. They're being raised as cattle. So they're within fences and they're, uh, they're not living as they did, but we still have bison. They're in national parks and state parks in wildlife preserves. And of course, we mentioned the Native American tribes that have bison. Finally, I wanna talk about the ups and downs of the bison. So we've talked about this, but I, we talked about 60 million bison out there, but there weren't always 60 million bison out there. They had their ups and downs too. We know that 60 million bison really came at a particular time the Native Americans over at least the last uh, two, 3,000 years burned regularly. They, uh, some of the early settlers talked about the fact they could always smell fire because they weren't burning one place, they were burning another. By burning, they would, they would knock back the shrubs, they would kill the grass so that more grass would grow up, it was fresh and green, and that would bring in bison, that would bring in deer that they could hunt and collect. And so during that period that we've talked about before with 60 million bison, they had been managed by the Native Americans for thousand, several thousand years. We think before that there were not nearly as many bison. They were healthy, they were living on their own, but they weren't in those vast uh, uh, herds that just covered the, the plains. So bison went from a normal life to having lots and lots and lots of stuff to eat and their normal predators uh, under control, the, the wolves uh, uh, decreased and not enough humans to affect them. We think then what happened when the Europeans arrived around 1600, they brought with them not only guns, not only their culture, they brought disease. They brought disease that they were immune to now that the Native Americans weren't. So over some estimates say that over 95%, over 95 of 100 uh, Native Americans died of disease in that several hundred year period. So the, the bison lost their main predator, the Native American uh, out there even before the Europeans came. So they've had their ups and downs. We're having that now, aren't we? Uh, we have certain species that disappear because of hunting, uh, we have, have to do conservation to bring them back or sometimes fail to. So the entire world is constantly shifting. It's never exactly the same. So with that, I think we've uh, got the end for today. Uh, we've got, if any questions, be happy to, to answer them. Uh, this, it's an interesting thing and you're gonna get to go out and handle these. So I think is super cool. This comes from Missouri Department of Conservation just so that they can teach people like you the value of bison. So uh, you can uh, knock us off here and uh, we'll, we'll go to questions. Step up, Barb, I need, need your hearing. <laughs> I have two questions. One, what was the disease? And two, how big can the bison grow up to? How big did the bison grow up okay. to? One was what were the right. diseases? Yeah, the diseases were measles, uh, smallpox, chicken pox even, things that had you and I can get shots for now, but if you were a kid back in that time, uh, you some of, the, some of your family or some of the people would die of that disease, but others would build up immunity. So the, most, of the, uh, most of the people had immunity to those diseases. The Native Americans had not been exposed to them ever. And so they died rapidly of all those things. I didn't look up. I, you caught me by surprise. I don't know how, uh, how big a bison was by poundage, but a bison will stand, uh, can stand over five and a half feet tall at the shoulder. That would be up to there. So it would be, uh, uh, they would be about the same height at the shoulder that Barb is. Okay. Um, now, do we have a bison hunting season? Uh, we don't have a hunting season here. Uh, there are the Native Americans on their tribe, tribal lands can have a hunting season, 
but the way they have that hunting season, it is just for the Native Americans. And they have drawings just like we do for, for uh, some animals we hunt. And then they have a ceremony and you can go on the internet and see the ceremonies that they have getting ready to go for hunt, hunt, hunting the bison. And then after they kill it, they have ceremonies to say thank you to the bison. Uh, so it's a lot of their tradition as well. Whenever a baby was born, would the whole herd stop? When the baby was born, would the whole oh. world herd stop? No, that's what's interesting. The, the herd didn't stop. They kept moving. That baby got up within a few hours and started moving. Now, the, uh, the herds with the, uh, the females and the babies moved slower but they, they just kept on the move. Uh, they, didn't, uh, they weren't as likely to take off and uh, 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 run rapidly like the male herds did. But the babies, that was really amazing. If you could imagine, if you've got a, a little brother or sister, and if you can imagine that when they're born in the hospital and by the time they come home, they're scrambling over to the dinner table, that's kind of what was going on at that time. <laughs> How the, um, the diseases is kind of like the disease we have now because of COVID-19, certain yes. humans and certain animals are dying from it. Is there what? Well, I, I, let you me see if I understand. You're talking, yeah, don't go away yet. You're so. talking about immunity and lack of immunity and its effect on humans when they encounter a disease that they, they've never encountered before, like COVID. Is that what you that COVID is is would be similar, a very right. similar thing. O only no one in the world had really experienced COVID, as far as we know. Uh, or if they did, they lived in such isolated places that it wasn't found uh, and kind of died out in those places. Yeah. But uh, when you, one of the things I was thinking about with the Civil War soldiers um, that we were talking about last week many of them got very, very sick when they got together as in, a, in their regiments because many of them had lived in very isolated areas, never had encountered measles, for example. Measles. And many of them very quickly were sick and many died of, of that uh, exposure to that uh, infection that they had never, never in, uh, encountered before and had no immunity to. Yeah, let's not go away from that subject for just a second. Uh, what will happen with COVID? Did that answer your question before you go? Yeah, do you have... Um... Was that it? Good, okay, okay good. Uh, let's go uh, think about COVID for a minute. What's happening? Two things are going to happen. People that got sick, now when they get well, they have antibodies. The antibodies fight, that's a chemical within their, their uh, system that fights it. We're now have a harvesting blood from some of those people as a treatment, but they will develop it and they will become resistant to the uh, COVID. Uh, and uh, then we're going to have pretty soon, we're going to have a vaccine. They're trying to put that together now. That vaccine is another way of giving you not an infection, but it gives you the chemical that your body uh, understands and reacts to so that you will be immune, just like you get measles shots or flu shots. How many of you get flu shots? Any of you? Yeah, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. right, I do too. Mm -hmm. With a flu shot, you're do making the person immune. Uh, then it'd be, if the Native Americans had been exposed to those things, they would have that immunity. That's where the problem came in. We will eventually be uh, immune to COVID for the most part, it may be a little be like flu. There'll be some cases that come back, but that happens uh, throughout history. Good question. I'm glad you asked that. Next. What are some other things that bison eat? What are some what? Uh, I, uh, that wasn't, I didn't hear it. It needs to be a little louder and or translated. What are some other things that bison eat? What are some other things that bison oh, eat? Oh, the other things that bison eat. Well, primarily they eat grasses and forbs. Forbs are flowers, okay? They're things that are flowering plants. And uh, even the wood bison, they were called wood bison 
the, the, spe the uh, species was back east, they were eating the stuff along the ground. They don't eat leaves. I'm sure they eat leaves if it's a little tree seedling so big, they would, they would be eating that too. But basically they're eating grass and they're eating forbs or plant, flowering plants. Um, what would happen if the bison went extinct or the Native Americans uh, weren't there to get, get rid of some of the bison and the bison got overpopulated or they went extinct? Good, good question. You know, that's true of everything. Things, we can get too many, we can get too little, we, they can go completely extinct. But right now we're having too many of a uh, two-legged walking around human. <laughs> we are getting more and more humans on the planet. And as we do that, we're kind of crowding out other things, aren't we? We're, we're seeing a lot of that. So what would happen? Uh, populations increase, populations decrease. When I was your age, we would have learned about what they talked about the foxes and the rabbits uh, in our area to be the coyotes and rabbits but there's sometimes you'll see lots and lots of rabbits right now this year this year we, is a pretty good rabbit year very big year for <laughs> rabbits now guess what we're seeing all over the field coyote poop with rabbit hair in it with rabbit hair solid rabbit hair what's going to happen the population drops down the coyotes either die off because they can't find food or they move to somewhere else where there's more rabbits. And meanwhile, the rabbit population builds up. That's true of everything. That's true of butterflies. It's true of birds. It's true of everything. We can overhunt or they can be over uh, harvested or they can die of disease that comes through. Uh, deer, we're worried about uh, the uh, hemorrhagic disease and uh, chronic wasting disease. So those populations go up and down. Very good question, thank you. Are there different kinds of bison? Yes, there are, thank you. There are six different kinds of bison or six different uh, uh, species, only two in the United States. That was the wood bison and the bison that we're talking about today, the prairie bison. But there are four other uh, bison that are in Europe and uh, uh, Asia. How much bison are in each pack of bison when they run? How much? Uh, uh, how many bison are in each herd when they oh, run? It can be variable, but the, the, uh, uh, the accounts that we had back in the 1830s, 1840s, uh, actually Lewis and Clark, which you're gonna be studying, Lewis and Clark's encounters, they were talking about herds of several thousands sometimes that were moving. And uh, I'm sure they reported the most impressive, just like you talk about the biggest deer you've seen, but they had, uh, they had massive herds that were out there that would cover the landscape as far as you can see at times. Cool. We got three more questions. Good. Okay. Um, whenever you said trains, do you mean like the trains that we see now or like other uh, trains? Maybe get a little closer. When you were talking about trains, did you mean the trains you see now or other trains? Oh yeah, the trains. You're talking about the trains. Oh, they looked a lot. Yeah, they're much different. The train. The trains looked a lot different. Uh, and you can see pictures of them. They were steam engines. They burned wood or coal later, but initially they burned wood. And uh, so they'd be belching out smoke. They didn't travel nearly as fast. And the bison could actually interfere with them on the railroad tracks. Uh, that, in fact, they had the, a, a big V in front of them called a cow catcher meant to push them off one way or the other. And the... Uh, 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 another thing that was bothering the railroads is the Native Americans didn't like them coming out there because that was their territory and they'd been given a reservation out there and now all of a sudden people are running through there. So at times the Native Americans would attack the train and that was one more reason that the military was trying to get the Native Americans 
off. They were killing a lot of them, unfortunately, and they were trying to get them off into reservations. The, if, if you look at the tribal histories, you find that each time they're getting into worse and worse land, uh, less quality land, harder place to make a living. Uh, one of the great ironies of the uh, Native Americans being pushed around is that the Cherokee were pushed down into Oklahoma to land that was not very good for farming. It was the least desirable land. And then they discovered oil under it and they became rich. So there's a little irony there. <laughs> Okay, two more. How, how valuable were the horns? Say, how, how what was the horns? Uh, sorry, we missed it. How valuable were the horns? How valuable? How, how valuable are the horns? Were the horns? Oh, the horns. They're really to us nowadays. They're not valuable. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure if you go to uh, shop out west, uh, let's say on a on an Indian reservation, that they might have them for sale, but they're not uh, of much value, uh, enough so that they, like I say, they actually work them to make these little cups that you're gonna see and other things out of them. But they're, they're pretty neat, uh, all the same. Remember what we said the other day, antlers are bone, horns are keratin. They're like your fingernail, okay? Keratin material, like your hair also. And so it can be, uh, it can be flexible if you if you trim your nails and after you've been in a shower you'll see how flexible that can be and then it dries and hardens again so it could be worked it could be boiled and reshaped <laughs> what a helper. julian had two questions so let him ask one more <laughs> okay how what were the hooves on the bison used for? What were the hooves on the bison oh, used for? That, that's, a good, that's a good question. What they did with the hooves, they would grind them up, boil them, probably boil them, then cut them up, then grind them up, and that would become glue. And so it, uh, it actually, uh, uh, cows, uh, cattle uh, and hooves, horses. and horses' uh, uh, hooves, were made into glue and around 1890, 1900. I don't know when that ended, but uh, when I was a kid, I, I, I knew that uh, some glues were still made out of hooves. And we used to, in fact, uh, there would be uh, nicknames for an old horse that's, uh, that's, uh, not, uh, that's not gonna live long. It's, uh, it's very sick and they'd call, they'd call it glue on the hoof. So it was, it was on its way to the, another phrase, is on its way to the glue factory. Okay. Plus they could be used for other things like yeah. game pieces. And right, they could carve them up as the Native Americans could. They could carve them. They, they probably used, they looked at that and said, here's something I can make out of it. <laughs> I have two questions, but the first one is, um, when they made the um, stuff out of the bison, is that how they would get the diseases? No, how, no, they didn't get the diseases no. from bison. No, they didn't. No, they didn't get any diseases from bison. They got it from humans coming in and human contact. So maybe a uh, trader would go into a Native American village, or the uh, Native American uh, uh, group would come to the uh, to the Europeans to barter to get some metal. They would pick up the European disease, take it back, and give it to the entire tribe. And there's records of times where 95 out of 100 uh, people in a tribe would die. Very few survive. No antibiotics or other things to treat those diseases. But it, that is a really good question because, yes, we can get diseases from animals mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. Right. In fact, there's, we think that the, the current COVID we came across was in bats. Uh, it could be other diseases, but we, like bats, can have rabies. So there are diseases you can get from them, but we can't blame the bison for this one. And she had a second question. Um, would the bison ever survive when the wolf pack would try to attack them? Would, would when the they bison were shot? ever survive when wolf packs attack? Them? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, they were good at fending themselves from wolves, but what the wolves would do would be try and isolate a bison. And if, the, if their friends didn't come in for the attack, 
then they could uh, the uh, they would bring it down. Actually, uh, what little I have seen written by some of uh, the accounts, they frequently were attacking the uh, the young, the or the frailest, or the frail. The so they would get a, the, a week. For instance, uh, if they were being attacked, the the bison rather than charging in might go running away, and they would pick off the last ones that are running, the ones that are the slowest or the weakest or were about to die anyway, or the young that couldn't travel as fast.